For we have come into his house to worship him. We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship him. We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship him. We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship Christ the Lord. Worship him, Christ the Lord. Let's forget about ourselves and magnify his name and worship him. Let's forget about ourselves and magnify his name and worship him. Let's forget about ourselves and magnify his name and worship Christ the Lord. Worship him, Christ the Lord. We come together to worship him. And how great is our God to worship him, number 140. Great is the Lord, he is holy and just, by his power we trust in his love. Great is the Lord, he is faithful and true, by his mercy he proves he is love. Great is the Lord and worthy of glory, great is the Lord and worthy of praise, great is the Lord, now lift up your voice, lift up your voice, great. By his mercy he proves he is love. Great are you, Lord, and worthy of glory. Great are you, Lord, and worthy of praise. Great are you, Lord, I lift up my voice. I lift up my voice. Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. Number 143, turn over one page. As we continue to worship him this morning, this is my Father's world. This is my Father's world, and to my listening ears, all nature sings and round me. This is my Father's world, I rest me in the thought, and rocks and trees of skies and seas, His hand the wonders roll. This is my Father's world, the birds are Yeah. 
shall be satisfied, and earth and heaven be one. And that wonderful, that last verse right there, even though everything in this world is happening and we think the, the evil and, and wrong is taking over, that it's not over. He will have his last say. Number 368, we don't serve a God who's dead and buried and gone. We see one who lives. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever man may say. I see his hand of mercy, I hear his voice of cheer, and just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know. I know that he is leading through all the stormy blast. The day of his appearing will come at last. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives. up your voice and sing eternal hallelujahs to Jesus Christ the King the hope of all who seek him the help of all who find none other is so loving so good and kind he lives he lives Christ Jesus lives today he walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way he lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Boy, that song should stir your heart to know that we serve a God who is alive and living in this world today. Last congregation hymn number 410, standing on the promises. You can't sing standing on the promises while you're sitting on the premises. So let's all stand as we sing. <laughs> standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises that cannot fail when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail. By the living word of God I shall prevail, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises I now can see, Perfect present cleansing in the blood for me. Standing in the liberty what Christ makes free. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God my Savior. Standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing 
Feeding on the promises of Christ the Lord Bound to Him eternally by love's strong cord Overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing, standing I'm standing on the promises of God Standing on the promises I cannot fall Listening every moment to the Spirit's call Resting in my Savior as my all in all Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing, standing I'm standing on the promises of God Amen So how'd that feel to get up and stretch your legs a little bit? <laughs> I tell you what, that song, I wonder how the writer of that song got to pick out which promises because, I mean, we could go on and on and on and on forever singing that song on the wonderful promises we have of Him. Again, another song that someone asked me to sing this morning. It's one you'll all will recognize. And it just shows how much we love Jesus. Jesus. We will be in John 21, 
John 21, starting with verse 1. And we've been in this study for quite a while. I think since the end of 2019, looking at the miracles of Jesus while He was here on earth. And we conclude with His last miracle. And many people would wonder, how can this be His last miracle? Last week, he, or two, yeah, what, two weeks ago, He cut the ear off of... Uh, a gentleman in the garden, Peter did, and he healed his ear, and then he went to the cross, and he was crucified, and went to the grave, and appeared on earth, so he was alive. So he was still on earth, and still alive when this miracle took place. He had not ascended to his Father in heaven yet, and it's these miracles, the, the, the greatest blessing I've gotten out of these, it shows us how much God loves us through the wonderful compassion he had for so many. And we're in John 21 verses 1 through 19. And it says, After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And on this wise showed he himself. They were together, Simon Peter, Thomas called Didymus, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and the two other of his disciples. Simon Peter said unto them, I go a fishing. They said unto him, We'll also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning was come, now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. He saith unto them, Children, have ye any meat? And they answered him, No. And he said unto them, Cast thy net on the right side of the ship, and you shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loves saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now then Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord. He girt his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked, and he did cast himself into the sea. And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from land, but it, as it were two hundred cubics, dragging the net with fishes. As soon, as, as soon then as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid thereon, and bread. Jesus said unto them, Bring of the fish which you have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land, full of great fishes, and a hundred and fifty and three. And for all there was so many, Yet was not the net broken. Jesus saith unto him, Come and dine. And none of the disciples durst ask him, Who art thou? Knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus then cometh and taketh bread, and giveth them, and fish likewise. Now this, now, this is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to the disciples after that he was risen from the dead. So when they had dined, Jesus said unto Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, Lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest I love thee. And he said unto him, Feed my lambs. And he saith unto him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And he saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest I love thee. He said unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he had said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things, thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus said unto him, Feed my sheep. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, When thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he, signifying by that what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said unto them, Follow me. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your words this morning. May they be a time of sweet fellowship with you as we come together to hear your words. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So throughout Scripture, in the life of Jesus... Peter is a picture of somebody with high hopes. He was somebody with much enthusiasm. But here Jesus was dead. And even though the disciples had seen him twice before this, 
yet they still did not truly understand the significance of who Jesus was. Just a little while ago, the disciples were in Jerusalem. They experienced a tumultuous series of events. They saw the triumphant entry into Jerusalem. They had the expectation from Jesus of a new kingdom. They had the betrayal of a trusted friend. They had the near arrest of themselves. They had denial of Jesus by their leader, Peter. And they agonized in crucifixion of Jesus. They had watched him un be crucified on the cross. Their leader was gone. They had all run away in fear. But then the resurrection and the manifestation of the risen Lord. Yes, they had witnessed that he had risen from the dead. He had appeared to him, them, and family and friends. But they still had a sense of loneliness. They were still confused. They were still unsure of the future. They were in a place where they began to reflect a part of each of us. When we get to the point where we feel total loss when something doesn't happen the way we think it should happen. And we've all been there. And this was especially true of the central figure in our verse, Peter. He had been called by God. He had been used by God. He had great pride in his loyalty to the Lord. He even stated that he had more love than all the others. And that he would never abandon his Lord. He even raised his sword when the Roman soldiers came to the garden to take him away. But then Peter denied him. Now Peter is confused and disappointed. But what's he disappointed in? Himself or in God? He's left wondering, what is in it? What does God have for me? What does this all mean? Have you ever been there? Perhaps you wondered or, or you faced while trying to manage life as usual and you get to a point where Peter is that you don't know. And what does Peter do? He goes fishing. He says, I'm, I'm just going to go on with life. I think the best thing to do is just not contemplate on everything and go on with life. There's no doubt that things will never be the same, but he just couldn't grasp what was happening in his life. It was beyond any pattern he had in his life before. Sometimes we think that if we would just drip away, if we would just go off and pretend like nothing ever happened, we could forget about it and forget the things we've done and what we've become. But Billy Sunday quoted as saying, when a Christian man starts looking back, it's only a question of time until he goes back. So just like Peter, all night sometimes you have labored or you've toiled or you've tasked over knowing something isn't right and you just don't know what to do. And it, life just never seems to come easy again because of that situation. But here's some good news. God isn't limited by our senses and our uncertainties. And what happens? Suddenly, Jesus is there. He had come before. They knew He was alive. But things started to get a little clearer this time. This experience right now was unexpected and undeniable. It was surprising and settling. The picture we get isn't that everyone became perfectly clear as to who he was or every answer had been given, but this encounter changed them forever. Why? Because it answered questions that really mattered. It answered questions about the transformation of the resurrection, the power of your life being transformed by Jesus, the risen Christ who encountered the grand questions that we all have in life. And the first one is, am I acceptable? Am I acceptable to God? A teenage girl left for school wearing one yellow and one orange sock. Her mother noticed this and headed her daughter off at the front door and asked her why she was wearing different socks. The teenager responded, I have the right to be different if I want to. And besides, everyone else at school is doing it. Hmm. We all want to be accepted. 
And we'll do weird things to receive that acceptance. Peter's failure was that he was suffering from a hangover of denial. He was confronted by a slave girl. And did you ever notice this? Peter became violent when this slave girl confronted him. In Matthew 26, 74, it says, He began to curse and swear, saying, I know not the man. Now, could you imagine that? Getting to the point where you start cursing the fact that somebody's telling you something and, and you're just adamant about it. That is when he heard an unusual sound. Remember, it was late night. Two men heard the rooster crow, Peter and Jesus. And it says in Luke twenty two sixty one, And the Lord turned and looked upon Peter, and Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. The last time Jesus spoke to Peter was with his eyes. Peter would never forget. Have you ever had that from your parents when you were a kid? You never forget that look. Peter will never forget that look that Jesus gave. And it says in verse 62, he went outside and wept bitterly. Peter now in this moment has all these memories of failure plaguing him, harassing him. He's just trying to get on with life. He's just trying to forget about everything he did. Spiritual failure made the memory of his calling painful instead of joyous. Now it seemed like a reminder of what he could have been instead of the promise of what he shall be. And Peter was faced with the reality of not being the person he wanted to be. It's the question that rises from the shame that lurks within our being. When we face the depths of the darker side, the thoughts that run through us, the deception, the disregard, the hatred, the harm, the, the pleasure misdirected, the indifference where we know we should feel love, but we don't. And we begin to wonder, am I fatally and forever flawed? Have my failures disqualified me? Yet, you know, sometimes people have to fall. And I mean really fall in order to face the nature of this question. Am I accepted? We saw that last week with these girls. They had to get to a point before they would accept it. Here we are reminded of the elements of the Bible. Have you ever noticed that nearly every leader whom God chose is shown not just to have faced failure, but personally failed miserably in devastating proportions? Have you ever noticed that? That most of the people that God chose failed miserably. Particularly in Peter's case. It's as if we have to experience failure in proportion to our own self-confidence. So the more self-confidence we are or that we have, God's going to cause us to fail even more. In order for us to see him for who he is. Like few who have ever lived on this earth, our current Western culture has worked hard to remove our sense of shame. They want to do everything for you to not feel shameful anymore in order to answer and alleviate that question of being accepted. Well, it don't matter. You be accepted. You know, there's a best-selling book in the 1970s called I'm Okay, You're Okay. Anybody ever see that book? If that's the case, what's wrong? If that was the number one selling book in the 1970s, what happened? If we're honest, we sense something good within us. That is what the risen Christ speaks of in our lives. The power of the resurrection is that there is a God who stands on the other side of Peter's failures and says, what? Come. He stands on the other side of our shame and says, come. He took our shame, bore it, bled and died for it, and he says, come. There is no other God that anyone worships 
that says, come besides the one who crucified for you. The power of the resurrection begins with the power of forgiveness, knowing that all our shame has been borne upon our Creator. And He comes to Peter personally. Just like He came to Mary personally that first morning at the tomb. Just like He speaks to us personally. There's a story of a test in school called the Whisper Test. It says, I grew up knowing I was different. I hated it. I was born with a cleft palate. And when I started school, my classmates made it clear to me how I looked to others. A little girl with a mishappened lip, a crooked nose, lopsided teeth, and garbled speech. When classmates would ask what happened to your lip, I'd tell them I'd fallen and cut it on a piece of glass. Somehow it seemed more acceptable to have suffered an accident than to have been born different. I was convinced that no one outside my family could love me. There was, however, a teacher in the second grade whom we all adored, Mrs. Leonard, her name. She was short, round, and happy, a sparkling lady. Annually, we had a hearing test. Mrs. Leonard gave the test to everyone in class, and finally it was my turn. I knew from past years that as we stood outside the door and covered one ear, the teacher sitting at her desk would whisper something. We would have to repeat it back. Things like, the sky is blue, or do you have new shoes? I waited for those words that God must have put in her mouth. Those seven words changed my life because Miss Leonard said in her whisper, I wish you were my little girl. God says that to every person deformed by sin. I wish you were my son. I wish you were my daughter. In the risen Christ, we encounter another question. No, not only are we acceptable, but am I alone in life? No one wants to be alone. No one. Years ago, in a city of Atlanta, there was a news report circulated about two lonely women. It said one of them spent $35,000 on dancing lessons just so she could be close to someone. The other, though perfectly healthy, went around town in a wheelchair with the hope that someone would come along and offer to push her. We have, all have this deep need to know we're not alone, that there's somebody there to push us. No doubt Peter had friends. He had good friends. But as we face the challenges of life, along with our fellow companions, we desire a connection that transcends everything and every place. It's like a child who, who naturally needs a parent's presence as a source to all that is beyond the child's understanding. Every one of us has that deep desire down not to be left alone to face life. I mean, you, you, you take Brittany. I mean, she's 30 some odd years old, but she still wants somebody there and a parent. I mean, we all have that desire. Peter had experienced what it was like to walk alongside such a guiding presence and power that Christ had. But this presence was taken away from him. He must have felt more alone now than ever before. But suddenly he discovers he's not alone. Peter discovers that God is now loose in the world, alive. And not only that, he wants to have breakfast with him. Frederick Buchner writes, For what we need to know, of course, is not just that God exists, not just that beyond the steely brightness of the stars, there's a cosmic intelligence of some kind that keeps the whole show going, but there is a God right here in the thick of our day-to-day -day lives who may not be writing messages about himself in the stars, but in one way or another is trying to get messages through our blindness as we move around down here, knee-deep in the fragrant muck and misery and marvel of this world. It is not objective proof of God's existence that we want, but the experience of God's presence. That is the miracle we really after, and that is also, I think, the miracle that we really get. It was the very reality of life with God which Jesus lived and came to impart in us. 
In John 16, 32, Jesus said, Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that you shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone. But he said, Yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. And now such a reality is ours, as he says in John 15, 4, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except you abide in me. In John 14, 23, Jesus answered, said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and he will come unto him and make our abode with him. Such knowledge empowers us to really live. Years ago, Columbia University had a great football coach by the name of Lou Little. One day, Lou had a boy try out for the varsity team who wasn't really good. But Lou noticed there was something unique about this boy. While he wasn't really good enough to make the team, he had this contagious spirit and enthusiasm. So Lou thought, well, this boy could be a great inspiration, so I'll put him on the bench. He'll never be able to play, but I'll leave him on the team to encourage the others. As the season went on, Lou began to develop a tremendous admiration and love for the boy. One of the things that especially impressed him was the manner by which the boy obviously cared for his father. Whenever the father would come to visit on the campus, the boy and his father would always be seen walking together arm in arm. An obvious indication of the exceptional bond of love between them. They could always be seen on Sunday going to and from the university chapel. It was obvious that theirs was a deep and mutual shared Christian faith. Then one day, a telephone call came to church, Coach Little. He was informed that the boy's father had just died. Would he be the one to tell the boy? What a, with a heavy heart, Lou informed the boy of his father's death and immediately left to go home to the funeral. Days later, the boy returned to the campus only two days before the biggest game of the season. Lou went to him and said, Is there anything I can do for you? Anything at all? And to the coach's astonishment, the boy said, Let me start the game on Saturday. Lou was taken back. He thought, Can I let him start? He's not good enough. But he remembered his promise to help, and he said, all right, you can start the game. And in the back of his mind, he said, you know, I'll leave him in for a few plays and take him out. Everything will be fine. Well, the big day arrived for the game, and to everyone's surprise, the coach started the boy who never played all season long. But imagine to the coach's surprise when the very first play from scrimmage, the boy was the one who single-handedly made a tackle that threw the opposing team for a loss. The boy went on to play inspired football play after play. In fact, he seemed so exceptional that Lou left him in for the entire game. The boy led his team to victory, was voted the outstanding player of the game. When the game was finally over, Lou approached the boy and said, Son, what got into you today? And the boy replied, You remember when my father would come visit here at school? We'd spend a lot of time together walking arm in arm around the campus. My father and I shared a secret that nobody around here knew anything about. He said, You see, my father was blind. And he said, For the first time today, he saw me play. So too, Peter discovered God was with him, watching him as he realized that Jesus could be anywhere by his spirit and would be everywhere, and he wanted to finally play inspired. Peter finally got it. He would never wonder again if he was ever alone. It's because of the reality of the resurrection that we too can be transformed, that we can be able to play above our heads in the game of life. So am I acceptable? Am I alone? But here's the, the big question everybody ponders. Will death be my end? No matter how much meaning is given in this life, there still lies what the Bible refers to as the final enemy, death. We as a culture 
try to deny death by turning from the reality of our age and physical death and start focusing on every possible means to live bigger and better lives. We watch superheroes in movies. We try all the thrills and pleasures of life. We play vicariously. We, we pay individuals millions of dollars to be our celebrities and our sports heroes. But if death is final, then a certain question hangs over life. And Peter wanted to know, will death be my end? And the very question was at the heart of debate with the religious leaders at that time. It was never one of the subjects that God ever elaborated on. So Jesus came speaking about eternity. And of course, Peter wanted to hold to this truth. But here's Peter and Jesus as they sit and eat breakfast. He sat before the other side of death. He saw the reality of a realm that transcends times and the temporal nature of the current existence. He saw Jesus alive. Until one is prepared to die, you can never really live. The power of the resurrection is the power of discovering eternity in our hearts. William Jennings Bryan quoted a saying, If the Heavenly Father designs to touch the divine power, the buried acorn of the buried acorn, to make it burst from its prison walls, will He leave you neglected in the earth, this man who was made in His image? If He stoops to give the rose bush, those withered blossoms that float with the autumn breeze, the sweet assurance of another springtime? Will he refuse the word of hope to the sons of man when frosts of life and winter come? No, I am sure that there is another life as I am sure I am alive today. Such a reality should change our perspective. There was a woman who was diagnosed with cancer. She's given three months to live. The doctor told her, make preparations. That's something we should be all doing all the time. So she contacted her pastor. He came to her house to discuss the certain aspects of her final wishes. She told him the songs she wanted to be sung, what scriptures she wanted read, what she wanted to wear. And the woman also told the pastor that she wanted to be buried with her favorite Bible. Everything was in order. The pastor was preparing to leave and the woman suddenly said, I have one more thing. And she said this excitingly. And the pastor said, what's that? And she said, this is very important. She said, I want to be buried with a fork in my right hand. The pastor stood looking at the woman, not quite knowing what to say. That shocks you, doesn't it? She said, well, to be honest, I'm puzzled by the request. The woman explained, in all my years of attending socials and functions where food was involved, my favorite part was when someone was clearing away the dishes from the main course, they would lean over to me and say, keep your fork. And when they would say that, the, I knew the best part was coming. When they told me to keep my fork, I, I knew that I was going to get something great with substance. It wasn't going to be jello or pudding. This was going to be pie or cake. So I just want people to see me there in the casket with a fork in my hand and want them to wonder what's with the fork. And then I want you to tell them something better is coming. Keep your fork. Through the events of the resurrection, we can discover God's response to the deepest questions we face. We discover that there is one who has the power to accept us despite our failures. That we are not alone. That His presence will even flow within us and among us. And that death will not be our end. But there's one more question that's fundamental to this story. And this isn't a question we ask. This is a question God asks of us. And he asked Peter that question when he said, Do you love me? 
This question has the power to sort out and sum up so much. Suddenly, the whole relationship comes into focus. Do I love God? And Jesus asks Peter this question three times. Maybe it was so Peter could finally reconcile in denying Christ three times. But now Peter is different. Peter thought he understood his love. And he had been quick to express his devotion, certain of what should happen to Jesus. And there was no need for suffering. But all that changed. Peter wasn't the same any longer. Peter had stepped out with pride before, but this time he's going to step out with grace. Peter was making this moment for him to renew his loyalties and affirm his responsibilities. So he, Jesus reissues the original call and says, follow me. Jesus' words echoes throughout the centuries. And today he makes this moment for us to renew our love and our loyalties to him. The story of Abraham Lincoln going to a slave auction one day. He was appalled to see how the traders and their customers mistreated the human beings that they were buying and selling. One young woman who was put on the block especially captured his attention. He could see in her eyes how the years of oppression had shriveled her soul. She regarded everyone around her with hatred and contempt. This moment of cruel humiliation was one more incident in the life field of nothing but abuse. When the bidding began, Lincoln offered a price. Someone else bid higher. Lincoln continued and continued to raise his bid until finally he had won. As he gave the auctioneer the cash and took the little slave girl, he glared at her and with bitterness in her eyes and asked what he was going to do with her. I'm going to set you free, he replied. The woman was skeptical and said, free? Free of what? He said, just free. Completely free. You mean free to do whatever I want? He said, yes, free to do whatever you want. Free to do whatever I want to say, whatever I want to say? And he said, yes, that's right. Free to say whatever you want to say. Free to go wherever I want to go? He said, yes, you may go wherever you want to go. And the girl, probably for the first time in her life, smiled and said, I'm going with you. That's what love does. So the biggest question that you can be asked this morning is, do you love Jesus? And will you follow him? That's all he wanted from Peter. And Peter finally realized in all his boldness and crassness and, and pride that he had in life while following Jesus came to a close because he finally saw grace for what it was. And that's the best part of life when grace comes to us and we see it for what it is. And even though we have all these questions to ask God this morning, He's asking you, do you love me? And if you do, follow me. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time that we've had this morning, this, this wonderful expression that we've been studying of your miracles while here on earth. And Lord, the miracles don't stop. We see them every day in our prayer request. We see wonderful answers. And we see wonderful guidance. And most of all, mercy and grace. And Lord, this last miracle, after your resurrection, should give us the grace and hope that we have with knowing that you are alive and serving and part of our lives and living through us through your Spirit. And Lord, may we know without a doubt that we love you. And we don't have to worry about any other questions. And that we are following you and feeding your sheep. Lord, we just thank you and we praise you for your words. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand number 482. Jesus is calling. Jesus is tenderly calling you home. Calling today. Calling today, 
Why from the sunshine of love will you roam farther and farther away? Calling today, calling today. Jesus is calling, is tenderly calling today. What has been blessing to be here this morning. I hope y'all were blessed and just drawn closer to him to worship him this morning and praise him and honor him for all he is and for all he does. P, would you dismiss us?